You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Maurit Sieben and I, Niels Kastrasen, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, where we share our experiences, the ups and the downs of what it's like to be a rules-based investor, and of course, where we also attempt to answer all of your questions. So, uh, good morning, Jerry. Good afternoon, Maurit. How are you guys doing today? Great. Hi, Jerry. Doing great. Hi, Niels. Hello. Good to have you back, Moritz, uh, after last week. But uh, before I dive into anything, I want to just, uh, as we do from time to time, I just want to acknowledge all the people uh, that uh, say very kind words about us and the podcast uh, in their social media and other ways by emails. Um, in in particular, uh, you know, this week um, there was a very nice tweet from Cantering Clark. Uh, and that got a lot of traction. And uh, just so you all know that we really do appreciate and and, and read your comments, and uh, we really appreciate uh, the support. The other little housekeeping thing I wanted to start out with today is just to say we mentioned last week that we're contemplating doing a live event from the three of us uh, in the fall, uh, most likely in, uh, in New York, I think. Uh, we'll see. Um, and uh, we've had very positive response. Um, there are still a handful of spots left. Uh, of uh, you know, So if any of you want to spend a couple of days with the three of us to uh, go into detail about your specific situations, whether it be trading systems design, um, whether it be building businesses, or whether it be you know finding investors for your for your fund uh, and uh, basically pick our brain for uh, for a couple of days, um, then you definitely need to uh, raise your hand and let us know um, by sending an email to info at toptradersonplug.com. And in the subject line, maybe you can just put live event and we know uh, what it's about. So with that in mind, um, another interesting week, I think, uh, with... Uh, you know, heightened uncertainty, driving stock markets down on Monday. Uh, of course, until investors decided that they should probably try and buy the dip, uh, as it usually uh, works. And also uh, trade negotiators soften their language a little bit, um, which not only helped markets uh, in the in the equity sector around the world, but it also had a very big impact on the grains in particular, uh, where we had seen this very nice steady downtrend for a while. And that came to an abrupt uh, end earlier this week, which I'm sure could be felt by many trend followers, uh, as we saw, I think, almost a 10% gain by wheat and corn uh, this week alone. Um, and, but, you know, trade negotiations were able to, uh, you know, pull these rapids out of their hat this week, um, which is kind of funny because, um, speaking of rapids, apparently the most expensive piece of art um, um, produced by a living artist, was sold this week for $91 million, and it turned out to be a faceless rapid uh, of stainless steel. So there we have it. Um, March, you're back. I'm not sure if you have any rapids to pull out today, but maybe you can share with us uh, how the week went um, and how you saw uh, the past week or so's uh, event from your portfolio point of view. Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. No, uh, no rabbit pulling out of the head here. Um, just like you said, I mean, it feels like we have some uh, political markets here with, you know, all the tweeting and the back and forth on tariffs and stuff. So yeah, equity is down at the beginning half of the week and then back up, um, which was which was great. Uh, I still, you know, I'm long the equities um, pretty much across the board. So I think net net over the week equities uh, had a positive return, so it did help me. At the same time, we saw bonds moving a leg up higher, so that was great. Also, uh, the crude markets, um, you know, up and down a bit, um, still along those. I think I made some money there too. Um, but regardless, I think the, uh, the 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 good news here is for me that um, after. Now close to five months in a drawdown, I'm still in a drawdown, but I'm getting back to, you know, just a sliver of moving into positive territory for the year. So uh, I'm hopeful about it. And 
you know, every time this happens, it's like, it, it reminds me, it's probably only like, you know, four, five, six weeks or something like that ago when, you know, the drawdown was probably at its worst for the year. And, uh, and we always, you know, keep on saying, well, you know, those, those things, they, uh, you can make them back real quick. And, um, so that's kind of like what has been happening. You work yourself out of the drawdown, continue doing the trades, just put them on. And before you know it, things look better. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, and, and just to touch on your last point, I mean, uh, when we look at drawdown recovery analysis, I mean, there's a, a, um, quite a consistent picture of how these recoveries tend to uh, emerge. It's difficult to know exactly how long the drawdown will be, but once it gets uh, into the recovery stage, um, they they look quite similar. So good to hear that uh, you're on your way, and uh, as are we. Um, you know, quite weak performance-wise overall, still pretty solid for the month of May and for the year, but... Uh, uh, a quiet week, really kind of uh, two camps, uh, losses from the up moves in grain. I think maybe we as a firm have perhaps uh, a little bit more exposure in in that sector compared to the industry right now. So so that was costly. But in, on the other hand, we also saw nice um, positive contribution from currencies, from fixed income. Uh, in particular, softs were pretty good. Um, and, uh, yeah, equity is probably flat, I would say. And so was the other, uh, commodities, uh, in, in general, not, a, you know, no changes in, in sort of the positioning or, or anything like that from an overall theme point of view, maybe slightly less exposure to fixed income, uh, compared to a couple of months ago, um, also a little bit less exposure overall to, equities compared to, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, agricultural still pretty stable, uh, FX pretty stable in terms of exposure. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting and it's nice to see that a bit more volatility is coming into to the markets. And, and there seemed to be a little bit more also divergence, uh, I would say, that we can take advantage of. But of course, Trade negotiations and 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 sound bites from from negotiators uh, will of course always impact markets in the short term uh, as they uh, did this week. Um, what about you, Jerry? How was how was the week for you? Pretty quiet week. Dollar, good to see dollar strength, uh, but also <clears throat> a few currency markets are stronger against the dollar. So it's nice not to have one hundred percent shorts. Um, <clears throat> I do think the grains are the interesting story, um, and the week is we got sort of hammered in stocks. We were making money in other markets. Uh, I know maybe the last time we had <clears throat> down in stocks, we uh, our other positions contributed to losses. So this this time the stock <clears throat> position losses were sort of offset by um, currencies and. Uh, some other markets. The <clears throat> I think that, uh, as I've said before, the corn and wheat and beans are sort of correlated, and they've been in downtrends for a while, and then all of a sudden they got uncorrelated. Beans kept going down, and the products, and then the wheat and corn rallied. So that's kind of kind of good. I mean, you know, I wish it all kept going down, but uh, it's the same thing you see in looking at single stocks, and hopefully you can get in some of the other markets that uh, some longs and shorts and temporary correlations uh, or uh, everything being short in a sector, and eventually it'll they'll have developed their own personalities and do something different. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was also a busy week. Lots of people attending conferences here in Europe and in the US, I think. So uh, we'll see if there's some interesting stories coming out from those events uh, in the coming days that we might be able to to tweet about, but uh, speaking of tweets, um, what uh, what got the most uh, reaction uh, and traction this week uh, on your side, Jerry? We had a couple uh, things that uh, <clears throat> people were kind of interested in and I was interested in. Um, let's see here. Um, I was on a TV show yesterday and um, enjoyed... Uh, been on TD Ameritrade and uh, talked about the markets and for the first time got no questions about fundamentals. So that was interesting. Uh, it was just strictly trend and 
how I look at the markets and taking small losses and things like that. And <clears throat> I had uh, gotten a lot of good fundamental information from my crack research crew, but uh, did not did not need to use it. So that was good. Yeah, yeah. What a change. Yeah. So I liked uh, one article um, about um, trend following and uh, more uh, ideas that trends are good and that trend following works. And I tweeted, uh, our analysis demonstrates that trends are a pervasive feature of markets and even factors providing the broadest cross-section of evidence of time series momentum to date. We conclude that the strong historical performance of trend following is robust across a large number of instruments. And this performance is neither explained by volatility scaling or static exposure, sort of a topic we get into every now and then. And so um, I didn't really know what that meant exactly, other than, I guess, they sort of proven that trend following kind of works either way if you fall target frequently or if you, like me, just put the position on. If it turns into a profit, you don't really do too much with it after that as, as far as uh, the quantity. You just uh, let it go. Yeah, who was behind that uh, research? I, the, I saw uh, it I as well, but I've forgotten already. An AQR, oh, it was an AQR, AQR yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, they do a lot of analysis uh, up there, so that's very helpful, I think. And um, and it is, I mean, again, we've talked about it before. I mean, there are, uh, although maybe momentum and trend following hasn't had the most positive um, commentary over the last uh, few years, um, I do certainly see that there are pockets of interest from some really solid investor types in the space. Um, which is which is good and ideally, uh, you know, where people might be able to get exposure to to this uh, for their portfolio before before the event, uh, and not like we saw last time where everybody was rushing in after two thousand and nine, or after two thousand eight really, but uh, rushing in in two thousand and nine um, after they really needed it the most. So yeah, well, more papers like that might help. What else got uh, traction on on your side? Well, I retweeted uh, a good short tweet from our friend Wayne Himmelsine, sure. um, and he goes on to say, I often hear or read in the media that in terms of various potential outcomes, there's a small chance of such, such and such happening. This statement is utterly meaningless. There's a small chance of literally anything happening. Um, given all the possibilities... Anything can always happen, and even in thin tail scenarios, rare events still can always happen, just less so. So I think that's one of the things we try to get across to people is how frequently um, things with small chances can happen and how it's just fine if that's going to dominate your performance, these outlier moves, these outlier trades that go a long ways further than anybody think they would go or even no, very few people can even see them coming. So uh, that's... What we love about trend following is the small losses, the large, large winners, the sort of uh, positive skew. Um, there was another tweet. I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but it was uh, someone tweeted that uh, they were wondering if there is positive alpha hidden inside of negative skew. So the... I thought that was a, just a beautiful way of putting it, that even if you have this, these frequent, small, medium-sized profits, uh, bad things can be hidden inside of there. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Moritz? You're very quiet today. <laughs> well, I'm listening in an interested way and actually looking at Jerry's uh, feed here. Um, one of the things I'm just picking that out, I'm not sure if, if you wanted to, to bring this up, Jerry, but I, I really like that is, our nervous system wasn't designed to handle this amount of information. Stress has an effect on your objectivity. When you're under stress, you act with 100% confidence. There you go, this way or that way, but you might be wrong. So conclusion there, trade small. Many independent bets really like that. Um, retweeted that also. And I think it is true, right? Um, with trading, you should never trade in such way that trading becomes a stressful experience that keeps you up at night or that starts dominating your life. It, if it gets to that point, then there's a very good indication that you're trading too large. That's right. I, <clears throat> I've said many times that the two most important things that I've 
think about trading are trade small and follow your system. And they kind of go hand in hand, uh, at least for me. I don't think I can follow my system uh, to the degree that I want to, close to 100%, if I'm stressed and I'm losing too much money from my personality or my client. I have never been a huge fan. I understand, you know, I understand the other side. So try to understand my side. I never have really enjoyed the comment that you should choose a, a trading approach that suits your personality. Because I, I don't know, I just don't think that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, you know, I would rather trade short term. Short term trading is hard. You got to be really smart or have a, uh, figure out an edge. And so everyone should want to trade shorter term. I just want to trade as successfully. And so I think uh, my personality may not be uh, 40% winning trades, large drawdowns, the trend following model, the long term nature of what I think is required these days. That's not my personality, but I do think my personality, interjecting my personal opinion on the level of risk and the volatility, you know, am I, it's a typical day for me, plus or minus 5% or plus or minus 50 basis points. I think that choice, and then maybe just realizing that uh, <clears throat> trading is hard, I'm, it's not going to suit your personality as much as you'd hoped it would. And I think that's a much more profitable way of looking at it, that um, it is no problem, uh, with uh, choosing a leverage and a risk uh, profile that suits your personality, much more so than a strategy that suits your personality. So what you're saying, Jerry, is in, in a sense, and I, I don't know if, if, if that is the case, but what you're saying is really first identify what can be, um, you know, researched and concluded to be a profitable strategy. In our case, we believe it's trend following. And then we kind of have to adapt our personality to get comfortable with it. That's right. You may have a, some minor <clears throat> choices to, that you can make. Yeah. That's, um, you choose, uh, because, you know, one thing, I choose something else, but to a large degree, setting your sights on something that fits my personality yeah. is, I think, totally backwards. Yeah, no, and, and the reason I wanted to make that clear is that I agree with you that there are so many people who will say the opposite and say, oh, yeah, trade something you're comfortable with. But actually, I completely agree with you. That may not be a very good idea uh, at all because what we're comfortable with is to taking a lot of profits, right? So we'll take two small profits, right? And what we're also comfortable with is, or maybe not comfortable with, is, is we, we don't like taking losses. So we'll probably end up taking losses that are way too big because we ignore them to begin with. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, trading is a business. It's not, uh, you shouldn't do it to, you know, just for joy and say, oh, this is great. This is just what my personality, um, you know, needs. Um, there, there, there is, I want to say, that I think to, to me there is at least two sides of comfortable with trading, I mean, one relates to risk and fall. And it's kind of like, yeah, I, you know, feel more comfortable with, just as Jerry said, you know, having ups and downs of 50 bips a day as opposed to 5% a day. But then, you know, if you take this down to, well, are you comfortable with one basis point risk per day up, down? And of course, yeah, I'd be comfortable with that, but I'd also be very uncomfortable with that because the likelihood of actually achieving the goals for which I've designed that system and for which I am in the markets and doing all of that research, they now kind of like become unrealistically uh, to achieve. And I don't want that either. So it needs to be a good balance between the risk and the volatility that you can, you know, you can and you're willing to take for that system. But it needs to harmonize with the goal that you have when trading in the markets. And, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, because we get a lot of questions about, you know, how to trade, how to become a CTA and, and all of that. But I would still, uh, I would still say that maybe it's not always the right thing. Uh, and, and probably I think more often than not, it's not the right thing to pursue a career uh, as a trend follower or, or, or an investor. I think a lot of people would do better uh, by taking a, kind of a more of a top-down view and say, okay, I've got this pot of money. I have a long-term objective of building wealth. And this is how I'm going to allocate that money uh, across a number of strategies or investment types and managers, whatever it might be. And that is going to be how I achieve my, my long-term goal. Because one of the things that I think we as managers actually get paid for is 
to be that filter, is to take that, you know, we are taking some emotional stress. I mean, even though the three of us might sound incredibly calm all the time, of course we are uh, influenced by whether we are in a 25% drawdown or whether we are making new highs. No doubt about it. But it just doesn't change the way we would trade uh, at all. Um, but I think it's, you know, that filter is is valuable. And so if we can take the stress out of uh, of investing for investors, uh, I think that's part of what they pay for, frankly. I agree totally. And I think that's a perfect solution. Just don't trade. It's not suited for you. <laughs> I think that that is what I would recommend. I think, though, yeah. that sometimes trading, uh, when I talk to people who want to trade and uh, or who do trade, my experience has been that it reminds me of their golf game. They're no good, but they're going to play. And that's true, you know, because golf, yeah, you know, sure. you can't farm it out to someone else. It makes yeah. no sense. Go play a round of golf for me. No, it doesn't matter how good or bad you are. It's your game. You're working on your game. You want to be good. And it's fun. And I think they see trading the same way. And that is... Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I could farm it out to you or I could give it to someone else who's going to follow the rules, follow the system, even when it doesn't feel right, but it's fun. And why would I give it to you? Well, you know, it's money and it's not golf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody gets what they want out of the market is what let's say Coda says and yeah. said, and if your goal is fun, then we'll go trade. But, you know, if it's just for the fun of it, the question may then be, is there going to be success at the end of that journey? Could end up being an expensive Actually, hobby, that's for sure. It can be an sure. expensive but it, hobby. I mean, it's not to say we're not trying to discourage people who really want to learn and become trend followers because you all have to start somewhere. But it's just that I, I think that people have to be really clear with the objective of why they want to do it, uh, you know, before they get mm -hmm. too, too far down the road. Anyway, good stuff, uh, Jerry. I'm sure you have more uh, interesting uh, tweets from this week. Yeah, well, I always uh, can find something that I agree with, with Howard Marks, and I love quoting him. Uh, I love the way he looks at the markets, even though he's not trend following. And he said this uh, on this uh, tweet, I've never considered it a, a legitimate goal to say that you're going to invest at the bottom. There is no price other than zero that can't be exceeded on the downside. So you can't really know where the bottom is other than in retrospect. So if you can't expect to buy at the bottom and it's hard to buy on the way up, that means you will you have to be willing to buy on the way down. It's our job as value investors to try to catch falling knives as skillfully as possible. And then I comment, not my job. <laughs> my job is to do the hard thing, manage risk. And he's almost, and he's got some good ideas there, but he, he's not going to go the trend following route. So he's not going to, he's going to come up with the wrong conclusion and just blowing off this idea. Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's hard to buy on the way up. You know, forget that idea. No, I'm not going to forget that idea. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Because it's not just buying on the way up. Sometimes that is, in retrospect, an amazingly low price. But I'm also going to pair it with a stop loss or the guarantee that I'm going to take a small loss and I'm going to be somewhat immune to uh, stress and uh, you know uh, having a trade-on that's going to ruin my portfolio. Yeah, I thought I think also I I did see that tweet and I did I commented on a, a different portion of it, which is this thing about the only price that can't be exceeded in is zero, and and I just made the remark that I think that's the same they said about interest rates a few years ago, and look where we are today: ten billion dollars worth of bonds, less than zero percent interest rates, negative interest rates. So anything can happen. Oh, I I really like the guy. I know he's not a trend follower, but. Uh... I had the pleasure of uh, seeing him live in Miami earlier this year. Uh, really liked uh, liked the you know this the show and and the way he talks and thinks about the market. So always feel that I can learn something from him. But um, it's just one of the things that that Jerry just said. I, I you know really true in retrospect, things that go up can look so amazingly cheap, right? but only with the benefit of hindsight. It's so difficult to do the trade when the thing is actually about to move up or in the process of moving up really, really fast. And, and we just had an example 
in the past, what was it? I don't know, five or six days, probably more than that, but it's Bitcoin again, right? So the thing was kind of like sleeping around $5,000, $5,500, something like that per Bitcoin. And then before you know it, it just starts going up relentlessly, like 6,000, 7,000. And it's like, yeah, 7,000, that's, that's where you buy because it, you know, it goes to 8,000. When it is 8,000, you look back, 7,000 is fantastically cheap. Of course, it's an extremely volatile market, but just to the point, um, it's so difficult to put that trade on at 7K, but if it's going up, it's going up. So better do it. And what it would take for that particular strategy to be trend following would be a very good indicator, that have pretty good ideas on how to buy near the lows. And, you know, we just, dis I just discount that totally. Um, <clears throat> why not let it rally a little from the low and then put in a protective stop? Yeah. You're, you're golden. Um, so the whole idea that you've got to be uh, very good at buying a market as it's going down, there's just no way you're going to beat waiting for the rally. It's over time, you know, and there's no need to. Um, they get a better, lower price. And, and also, we tweeted this week or last week that uh, <clears throat> that particular style spins out of control. The trend following... Uh, as soon as we buy the trade and it goes against us, it's it's a worse trade. We're not going to add to it. We're going to be disciplined and sit with our stop loss. I don't ever. I have never believed that um, when you buy a breakout, it should show a profit pretty soon, or it's a bad trade and just get out. No, no. Follow your system. You've done research on the the amount of uh, your exit prices and your stop losses and the amount of room to give a trade, so you're not getting in and out all the time. Uh, you can't force the market to do something and uh, show some strength immediately. I mean, uh, you know, just be patient with your system and then uh, get out with a loss if that, or if it rallies and goes higher. But in, in, an, in the counter trend strategy, value, the, the losing trade becomes a better a trade. We need to buy more. And this can just totally spin out of control. It's not money management. It's not risk management in any way. And we're so fortunate to have embedded this, uh, all this risk management that, that is inherent uh, to proper trend following. It's just so much safer for your pocketbook and your financial well-being to buy the strong market as opposed to the weak market and buy the expensive market and not the cheap market, even though that's so counterintuitive because pretty much everywhere else in life, the opposite is true, right? You can, you know, buy things, you get a better deal, with discount, buy them cheaper, you know, you know, like all the physical goods out there that we consume. But no, 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 not, not in the financial markets. Buying the strong rising market is so much safer than buying the weak, cheap market, even though it's so difficult to, you know, carry that out emotionally. And I, every now and then I see this quote that uh, professional people will post on Twitter or on their website, and it's... Correct me, but it's something like this. Um, the stock market is the only place where when things go on sale, people refuse to buy. And so... I think this is Howard Marks, yeah. something like that. Uh, I'm not, uh, people uh, quote whoever said it. It was probably Howard, yeah. So, And I think that, uh, you know, then the next week, uh, the same people who post something like that will write an article about how great trend following is or momentum. And so... Uh, I, I don't understand that, but I think it's uh, obvious. Of course, uh, people's brain is telling them uh, something's amiss here, something's wrong here. Uh, I, I I like my wealth. I don't want to see it to continue to go low. Now is maybe a time to be a little defensive. If that is what's in the majority of people's brains, that's a good thing. And so far from that being a silly thing. How would, why would you not just step in and buy, as we, as we uh, evidence by our the way we've traded the markets, this is exactly the correct instinct. F uh, flee, do not uh, minimally don't add when the market's uh, going down or going against you. Yeah, well, I mean we we learn early on from the media that you have to buy low and sell high. The problem is they don't really tell you what low really means and what high really means. And and so without rules in any strategy, um, you're in, you, you, you know, you're 
most likely in for unpleasant surprise. Uh, that's for sure. Which is, I mean, I, I was listening to you guys talking about this, and this is, of course, something that is not new. We've talked about these things, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, and yet it is still sometimes surprising that people find it um, difficult to embrace, uh, frankly. Um, so, anyways... What else? Or do you want to go to questions? Or um... Let's do one more. Yeah. Um, this uh, was a good article that I read from ETF.com uh, called uh, Hold on. Trend Following as Insurance. So uh, this gentleman writes about trend following every now and then positively, and uh, that's why I'm always checking his site. <laughs> But he says that um, most investors believe that when it comes to evaluating a strategy, three years is a long time, five years is a very long time, and 10 years is an eternity. However, financial economists know that 10 years can be nothing more than noise. Uh, boy, doesn't that suit our plight that we're in? So we want people to realize that um, evidently when you do research on different strategies in the past, Strategies that have been declared dead because the performance was um, below a benchmark over 10 years, they can come back and resume uh, doing well. Absolutely. Speaking about the 10 years, um, I remember earlier this week I picked something up that, like, you know, it's customary for asset managers or journalists, I don't know, probably everyone, to look at 10-year periods and you have that 10-year look back on performance. And it just so happens that the financial crisis is now 10 years ago. So now that window starts shifting such that the returns of the financial crisis are no longer included, meaning that, so the, you know, the, the article was saying, well, you know, this is what we're going to be seeing an incredible bump up in the quality of returns that are being reported because people stop looking back longer than the 10 years. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. So let's just erase that from our... Yeah, the expected return is just increased. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's doubled. Yeah. Must be true. Power of numbers and statistics. Um, All right, well, let's uh, let's do a few questions. Uh, And uh, as a reminder, if you have questions for us that you want us to tackle, then um, send them to info at toptradersunplug.com and we'll do our best to get them answered uh, the same week. This one is actually a question that came um, before last weekend, but it was from Moritz, so we saved it. It is from Michael. And Michael writes, Moritz mentioned that his system may take some risk off if a position makes a fast move in the direction of his trade. Is this because volatility increased before P&L was sufficient to absorb the increased risk? So that one, Moritz, we can't help you with I can only help myself with that one. Exactly, yeah. No, it's it's not because of the volatility. So, um, you know, imagine a, a breakout to the upside and then a very, very quick follow through to the upside um, with my initial stop and then trading stop not having had a chance really to react to that strong move up, right? So what that means is that I have a lot of open profit sitting there, which, of course, you know, we can be liberal with... Uh, with uh, open profits, um, but you know it has it has realized or it has pro- been produced in such a short amount of time, and with now such a you know larger than usual distance or larger than much larger than average distance to one of my stops, that that uh, I have found for myself is uh, is a good opportunity to take some of that size off the market. Definitely not all of it. It's not going to be a full exit. It's just going to be a reduction in size. Yeah, so a rule that you have researched and found to be helpful yes. with your start of uh, start of trading. Um, do you know how much it it adds when you apply it over over time? I mean, is it uh, you know a, a, a bump up of ten percent of your performance? Oh no, so oh, to no, speak, no, 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 no. So that's I think no, I don't mean ten percent in in absolute <laughs> terms, but you know it might increase your return from say ten to eleven percent on average. No, no, not even that. It's it's, it's okay. minor, and and I've I've mentioned that before. That's one of the things in my system where you know maybe you're accused of working with a small sample size because it is kind of like you know it happens at at extreme points. So I I I uh, 
it, it wouldn't be right for me to say that I'm looking back at like, you know, a sample size of 2000s, uh, you know, or, or anything like that on that. It, I, I don't have that large a sample, but I still have that in there because it, it suits my thinking and risk preference um, during those periods of time. So I, I look at that more like a risk management, money management tool um, in the larger context of my portfolio as opposed to really having that in there as a performance kicker. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I'm in favor of things like that. I think to some degree, you know, when you're committed to managing uh, losses, keeping them small, I think it's okay to have maybe a strategy that where you have a crazy windfall profit and it's the market's kind of crazy uh, to liquidate a piece of it or take something off the table to sort of manage the month or the week or whatever. But um, it's probably, in my opinion, probably not subject to a back test since there would be so few of these fun, great trades to look at. So I would just wing it. And if you felt like you got a lot of risk, the ATR is double, triple, quadrupled. Yeah, why not? Do you, um, no big deal. Do you put it back later on, Mortz? Would you put it back later on if if then the markets retrace and you no. kind of say, yeah, okay. No, no, I don't have that. But, okay. you know, it's, it's also, not, I'm not even halving uh, uh, my position. So I, you know, the majority of that initial trade stays on, no yeah. doubt about it. Cool. Good question. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, you're clearly paying attention to every word from Moritz, so that's uh, that's great. Here's a, someone else who's uh, been paying attention to uh, what Jerry has been saying, but we'll see if uh, how this uh, goes. So um, I have a question for the next podcast, and this one is for Mr. Parker. Can you walk us through your investment in Salem Abrams Fund? What were your reasons for investing in his fund? You say he has a lot of guts. Does that imply that the amount of leverage he was taking was more in line with Richard Dennis than you? Thank you very much. This uh, question is from uh, Mohit. Uh, So I think that's a question that only you can answer, Jerry. So I met Salem when he was a senior at Notre Dame and... uh, he was interested in trading, and he was a sort of relative of mine, uh, in-law relative. My f- first wife's cousin by marriage. So he was very interested in uh, <clears throat> trading and trend following. And then uh, he and I bought a copy of um, what was called System Writer. Now it's called uh, something else, the back testing program that came out right around 88 when I started Chesapeake. And so we would do some research projects together. But, um, and then I think that, you know, he's built a nice firm and he's moved away from trend into multi-strategy, uh, shorter term, medium term. And uh, I think some still some long-term trend. But uh, I guess the I know one of the th- things I've admired about him over the years is just his ability to stick to the system and uh, regardless of the drawdown and, you know how bad we all feel when we are not doing well, the performance is low. So he just uh, comes out of that drawdown so quickly, not, I don't think, for extra leverage or guessing, but just simply following the strategy that got him in that hole. And we've talked about that before. What got me in is what's going to get me out. Oh, maybe I'll tweak it a little bit uh, to improve it just in general. You know, your research uh, juices should be flowing at an all-time high when you're in a drawdown let's say but uh yeah. so i think that's one of his big it, he's just a total stud when it comes to following the system and you're like well doesn't everybody follow it well it's hard you know not all the time so that's what that's what the hopefully a, a cta with a good track record can offer to clients is a uh, pretty good system but i'm going to implement it all the time just the way i should yeah, Salem is definitely a straight shooter when it comes to trend following. And, um, you know, we'll see. Maybe he'll come and join us uh, on one of our conversations and, and talk a little bit about uh, his style of uh, trend following and experience. Uh, that could be fun. Um, next question is from uh, Francois. And uh, this is a little bit different. So you have to uh, put on your memory caps here. Um 
So, and and let's see how we go with this question. Um, I'm finally reading When Genius Failed, uh, which is the fascinating story of long-term capital management in the mid-90s. It is a timeless example of what very smart people, including PhDs, Nobel laureates, are capable of when fueled by ego and greed. Could you please share with your audio, or with your audience what you guys remember of LTCM from anecdotes to lessons? Um, and um, yeah, so so I don't. <laughs> I don't know how we approach that. Do you remember anything specifically about that time? Obviously, we're back in 1998, August, if I'm not mistaken. Gary, Moritz, what uh, what do you recall from that time uh, back then? Um, well, maybe I just start on that. Uh, I've, I've been, you know, this is now more than 20 years ago, so uh, I, I didn't really have any experience in the markets or at least not a lot of experience in the markets back then and so i only came to learn about elta cm uh later on um through the same book and other books written about it and so yeah i mean the what are the big takeaways um obviously you know the guys coming out of Salomon brothers john merriweather and the guys doing on the run off the run trades in us treasuries um essentially rv relative value trades across the boards currencies and um you know superstar academic team with martin's goals um some other guys on there so it's kind of like it uh I, I think they're up in greenwich um you know sounds too good to be true and they started with um spectacular performance for a couple of years um, you know, had a lot of AUM uh, because the returns were so good. But obviously the takeaway is, you know, in order to produce those arbitrage trades, those long, short and RV positions, they required a lot of leverage. And so they had a lot of leverage on and then things happen like the Russia crisis in 98 and dislocations in the currency markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just the the amount of leverage they had and the risk that they had on with you know a hindsight or a simulation or however they did it they felt they were safe and secure and that nothing could really go wrong kind of like on the titanic but then you know the market movement was so severe that the leverage was too much and that just broke them um so for me what does it mean the lesson is be careful on leverage so i'm not i'm not an rv relative value trader as you know as a trend following trader you have directional positions one way or the other so there's no need um for me to create a long short position and then really leverage that spread up um, to get a meaningful volatility and return so i'm, I'm kind of like in a different camp but the same thing holds no matter how you trade leverage is a double-edged sword and if you have too much of it, then your risk of ruin, no matter how you slice and dice it, just increases. And I just need to be so careful about that because I want to keep on trading and have a very, very long-term track record to show at a certain point in time. So this risk of ruin thing, I need to you know, take that extremely seriously and not, not, not play around with that one easily. Jerry, what are your uh, memories of um, of that time? Well, I think uh, that uh, situation is often used as um, counter to what we do, trend following, where we're um, playing for a, a move away from uh, normal and uh, not a mean reversion, let's say, but uh, uh, <clears throat> the opposite, and they... I think got themselves into this situation we talked about earlier of uh, when the trade turns into a loser, it's actually a better trade. Uh, to, certainly leverage was a key. And then I think people knowing what their positions were and understanding that they needed to get out of those positions, I think also uh, illiquid markets, too much leverage, counter trend. Uh, I don't know. Do you think I, does that make sense to you? Uh, is that Was that part of it? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> so my memories are really from, uh, I mean, so I think there are two things. I think it is true, like Moritz says, I mean, a lot of the things that we we seem to remember now is probably what we've learned after uh, the event and, and all of those things. I mean, uh, my memories are that, uh, first of all, uh, you know, traveling around uh, Europe, uh, meeting potential investors, et cetera, et cetera, for, you know, for a trend following strategy, um, people were mostly interested in buying things like long-term capital management. And they, you know, they had, you know, uh, uh, an amazing Rolodex of, of clients. Everybody loved them. Everybody wanted them uh, you know, to invest with them. Uh, I think from memory, even central banks put money with them, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that's why they ended up getting bailed out by central banks in the end. Um, but I think it shows one thing, and that's going back to this very simple, uh, you know, test that Andrew Lowe does every time he starts his uh, a talk. Uh, uh, you know, Andrew Lowe, who uh, a professor at at MIT and 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 a trend follower through his uh, the firm that he founded, Alpha Alpha Simplex. I mean. Uh, you know, where he just takes a very simple sample uh, question with people showing them, you know, four different types of investment they can choose from. And everybody see, uh, always uh, chooses the one that is most stable and has, you know, a decent return, but is as, as stable as, as you can get. And of course, that is exactly why, uh, you know, long-term capital management raised a lot of money because it was super stable. That's why Bernie Madoff raised a lot of money because it was super stable. It just doesn't, it just wasn't true, but it's just human bias, right? That this is what we want deep down. But I think that uh, what you said, Moritz and, 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 and Jerry is that, uh, you know, it's very rare, frankly, at least in, in, in my career, it's very rare to come across anyone who have been able to keep uh, or been able to create a long-term track record based on a strategy like this. I remember another fund that became very popular in the 90s. Maybe you remember this, Jerry, because uh, it was Triple I. And Triple I was doing something similar, I think, some kind of arbitrage strategy. And there were other strategies in that field. Um, but they all kind of end up in the same situation where suddenly... Uh, losses just, uh, you know, amount to um, something, you know, beyond imagination. Um, and so th those are some of my uh, memories that, you know, how popular things can become uh, and and unfortunately how often it is uh, something that, that later in life unravels and a lot of investors lose money and then it and then it spills over to the whole hedge fund industry or, or managed futures industry that, you know, this is just too risky. It's just the worst thing you can invest in. La 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 la. Yet, on on on, you know, in our little world within that uh, universe, where risk management really is something that we pay so much attention to, and where we've been through so many different regimes, we're still here. We're still making new highs. Um, but because we can't do it in a straight line, we can't take inherently volatile markets and put them through a model and take out all the volatility and just have the return left, people don't like it. But that's reality. That's how it really works. Uh, anything that, you know, claims to be able to do that, I just don't think it has a long-term uh, success rate. Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, the sort of mean reversion is sort of pr preferred, mm. you know, of people, things that oh, should come back together. I can see that happening. Coke and Pepsi, you know, Coke sell Coke and buy Pepsi. And it's kind of funny how Wayne told us about doing the opposite. He said, let's, uh, everyone's doing that. Let's see if they don't get further apart, play for this outlier. Not going to happen that often, not going to be that reliable, but it could be some big profits. So that's the equation that no one likes. Um, <clears throat> and another thing, when you couple that with really smart people, mm -hmm. oh my God, people yeah. love that. PhDs, Nobel right. It was yeah. a Nobel guy yeah. on there, right? So, uh, oh my gosh, the stamp of approval. I'm hanging out, I've had my money with the smartest people. I mean, uh, so I think, you know, if you're going to trend follow, if you're going to use price and low variables, and uh, then just don't tell people about it. Be smart, get your PhD, then uh, try to figure out a way to uh, 
mm-hmm. not let people know that, uh, well, I'm you know, following prices and taking small losses, not trying to predict and playing for outlier moves. So that's a, definitely a good lesson. Uh, my experience, if you can pull it off, but uh, I think, yeah. Well, we're that, kind of back uh, to this point that you, yeah. But I was going to say the triple I is still around. And so they're around. They're smart guys as well. They, they, they survived. Well, they had multiple funds. So maybe, I know I was invested in one of their funds, and it has the greatest name of all time. And that is, um, and I think I lost, I don't know if I lost all my money, but it was a large part of it. And it was called the uh, HRO, HRO fund, high risk opportunity. So definitely yeah. was high risk. Definitely. There's a um, another great book. I'd be remiss not to mention that next to When Genius Failed. It's uh, called Inventing Money by Nicholas Dunbar. I'd probably put that on the same level as uh, When Genius Failed. Really, really great account of LTCM with a lot of detail about the firm and how they trade it. So for those out there who are interested in studying that episode and that particular firm, a bit more in a bit more detail than that book. I, I really recommend it. I think the other thing that it actually, uh, now that I think about it, that that it kind of reminds me of, which again may not really have changed despite uh, many of these examples, is that when you have something that works, it is so tempting to grow it too big. Because who knows? I mean, I think that uh, some of the strategies that they were doing, maybe they were, you know, perfectly sound, but on a certain level of assets. I mean, I do remember from back then that it came out that they had been invested in, for example, government mortgage back, a Danish government, it's not government, Danish mortgage backed securities. And I, since I started out my career as a uh, bond dealer in Denmark, um, you know, when I heard that, I'm thinking with those amounts of money, they're trying to get in and out of Danish bonds. <laughs> it just seemed crazy. Uh, so I think that's always that's another lesson that I would take away uh, is that you 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 have to be you have to be humble and not think that you can walk on water with a strategy and and think that size you know won't um, have an effect or an impact. It may not. It's like with a lot of these um, conversion strategies, it may not show up for a while, but when it does show up, it's it's too late um, and you get crushed. All righty. Uh, last question for today uh, is from Khalif. Um, Khalif says, um, so again, this is a, maybe a little bit of a hard one, uh, not, not, you know, not completely uh, black and white question. Um, he starts out by saying, I really enjoy your podcast. I've learned and applied some of the discussed approaches to risk management. It's made me a better investor. So thanks for that. Well, we certainly appreciate that comment, Khalif. An, in- an interesting topic that I'd like to hear you, Jerry, and Moritz deep dive on is market regimes in trend following. Does your investment approach consider market regimes as a factor? If so, what technical approach do you use to quantify these factors slash signals? Have you ever tested the efficacy of market regimes as a trend following signal. Now, I went back to Khalif because I wasn't entirely sure what was meant by market regimes. And he says, I use the term market regimes as a descriptive way of passing participants in the market. Who are the players, i.e. institutions, retail, seasonal, momentum players, hedges, and what does the regular distribution of players look like in different in differing time periods, um, do you know of any quantitative methods that can be used to identify or classify market regimes? Now, I don't know how much um, quality I can add to an answer of this, um, but what I will say is something that came up when I was traveling this week, attending uh, a conference in Monaco um, and where you always meet um, people, friends, uh, competitors, or peers, however you wouldn't describe it. And, um, and I think someone, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong in terms of the source of this, but I think at least the discussion point came up about how the last six or seven months uh, has been the uh, shortest period of time in terms of the number of 
different regimes we've seen. And I guess in this case, they're referring to equity markets, right? We had a bull market going into October, then a bear market, now another bull market. And and having those changes in, in um, quote-unquote regime, for equities at least, uh, we've never seen so many shifts in such a short period of time. I'm not entirely sure, Khalif, if that's uh, also a way you would describe uh, regimes, but um, let me throw it out to you guys, uh, Moritz and, and Jerry, and and uh, see what you get from from this question and how we may be able to answer Khalif uh, on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a. Uh, how do you understand the way? If if I told, if I asked you, Moritz, about mark market regimes, how do you what 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 intuitively comes to to mind when we talk about market regimes? Right, so that's exactly the point. I think uh, market regimes and the way people define them or look at them, it's subjective to the person uh, talking about it. A market regime to me maybe you know look something different than a market regime to to you. I mean, when does that bull market start? When does it stop? What is a regime? Is it driven by interest rates? Is it driven by commodity prices? By people participating in the markets, there, I, there's not a clear-cut answer, not, at least not for me, as to what a regime is. When you look at you know, history, then you may look at a chart and say, there has been a regime here and there has been a regime there, but I don't really think it's that clear-cut. Um, and so maybe let me start with the easy answer, and then we can, if we want, try to get more more complex about it if it helps. But the easy answer um, to one of his questions is when he asks, uh, do I look at other things or like, you know, people participating in the market or the, the level of AUM and institutional investors versus retail investors in the market? And here the answer is very clearly, no, I do not. Um, the, the, the thing I use is price. That's the objective input. That's the only objective input I can get uh, from, you know, the, the amount of data out there. And that's what I use. I do not, you know, um, use any other thing, uh, any, you know, fundamental or any other data that's reported about who's trading the markets or how large those traders are. I, I just don't do that. So that's, that's an easy answer. And then um, even for, even if I, were able to identify a regime in historical data, like, you know, looking at the structure of the data and looking at patterns of the data and say there has been a regime here, there has been a regime there. I'm not sure that there will be that many, like, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of different regimes that I could come up with a system to backtest and say, well, if it looks like that, then I need to change my system to, you know, from A to B. And if it reverts, then back from B to A. Um, so I don't do it. I I also, you know, nobody knows, certainly the three of us don't know, um, what type of market regimes there will be in, in, in the future. And so the best guess I have, the best shot I have at those markets is to stick to my system in the way that I've designed it, looking back over, back over all the data that, you know, I could find to test it. And there may be, you know, certain regimes in there um, when that system has traded better than in other times. But um, I just accept that as a fact. And uh, I, I don't see how I could change it. What are, you, what are your thoughts, uh, Jerry? I've got a few thoughts, but I'll wait to hear yours first. If... Oh, man, are pretty predictable. I only have one thing I always <laughs> talk about, and it's just... Uh, another evidence of people's desire to fine tune things and um, have, accept a smaller sample size and try to define things down to certain periods and let's over optimize that. And we're just going to get fewer examples of trades and, and there's a lot of subjectivity it seems to be introduced into that sort of thinking as well. I follow trends, I follow prices but I think it's just for one reason, and that is to have a back test that has a large sample size, as large as possible. I've been, I hear people talk about things like, well, now I have enough data, commodities data, 
I found some new commodities data that now I'm going to trade the commodities with their own system. Yeah, I don't even like that. I mean, do we ever have enough? And what's the difference going to be? You know, I'm not sure. So I'm just Johnny one note on this, always saying the same thing, sample size. No, um, and and I think it's true, and I, I I'm 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 on your side on this one in the sense that what I would say to you, Khalif, is that, as as Jerry alluded to, you know, one of the things with trend following is that it's meant to adapt to whatever regime, quote unquote, that is out there. This is this is a strategy that is not meant to only work in certain um, periods, and uh, we we know it won't work uh, in all periods for sure. But it's not. We're not trying to be, uh, you know, outthink what's going to happen. So I don't think. I mean, personally, I don't think you should spend much time on if you are trying to do trend following to try and guess. Uh, you know, who who are the other players in the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It doesn't really matter, and it doesn't really matter why markets move. We talked about it uh, a couple of months ago when suddenly lean hogs went up by seventy five percent, and and initially none of us really knew why until we had to go and look it up uh, on the internet and it was an African swine flu. But it really doesn't matter. The, you know, if you are, you know, diehard trend follower, uh, you know, why things are moving and therefore I wouldn't spend too much time trying to figure out, uh, you know, different regime changes. What you can say, and I don't know if this is what you allude to, but clearly a lot of people talk about the post-financial crisis period and where clearly uh, central banks have been a lot more active than before um, and maybe you could classify that as a regime, but but so what? Even if you classify it as a regime, it doesn't really uh, give you a big clue about how to trade it differently as you would otherwise trade. And and as uh, I think Moritz already said, you don't we don't know these things in advance anyway. So uh, how could we plan for it? Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe not the answer you were looking for, Khalif, uh, in terms of. Uh, being very concrete, but uh, I think we're all in the camp that uh, we're, we're not really trying to predict or, or or quantify anything other than just look at the price and, and let that dictate what the models, uh, how the models should react. But we appreciate the question. We appreciate all of the questions as usual. So uh, keep them uh, coming for sure. Jerry Moritz, those were the questions. Any other uh, main topics? Uh, well, let's get back to that in about 15 seconds once I've uh, gone through the performance so far this month and we can talk about any anything else you want to discuss. Um, but CTA's performance as of Thursday um, uh, and of course Friday, I'm not sure. I think it could be an okay day for the industry. So... Uh, returns might be a little bit better than what I'm quoting. But as of Thursday, at least, we had the beta 50 index down 97 basis points, but still up 3.89 for the year. Uh, the SUCGEN CTA index down uh, 83 basis points, uh, still up 3.85% for the year. The trend index was down 1.12%, uh, up 6.01 for the year. The SUCGEN short-term traders index down 57 basis points for the month of May, down 2.65% for the year. And the Bridge Alternatives Index was down 30 basis points for May, uh, up 3.87% for the year. So uh, just again, a quick reminder, uh, as I said earlier on, uh, we are uh, planning to do a live event where you get a chance to uh, be with us for two days and ask us all your questions for us to help you make some breakthrough in, in your business or in your trading. Um, make use of, um, yeah, 50, 60 plus years of experiences in, in this industry. Um, so if you want to uh, be part of a very small uh, group that uh, will sit down and, and do this, uh, most likely, I would say, in, in maybe New York, uh, then uh, by all means, send us an email uh, to info at toptradersandplug.com. Uh, there are still uh, a few places uh, left as far as I can tell, um, but not more than a handful. So uh, please do let us know as soon as possible so we can make our plans a little bit more concrete from there. Um, what uh, what else do you want to bring up? We are... You know, we're good on time today. We've only been going for about an hour and five minutes, which is uh, which is shorter than normal. So Unusual uh, for us. Unusual for us, mm -hmm. yeah. So is there any 
meaty items you want to bring up? Anything that came to mind um, during the last week or so? I mean, I know there's been some articles out. Uh, I didn't have a chance to read them, but uh, is there anything you picked up that you thought was uh, interesting for our our listeners to uh, to dive into or anything else? Oh, well, maybe we uh, we throw it out there. There's an article that, uh, you know, I, I definitely found interesting by Transtrend about um, the only alpha that exists is negative alpha and uh, you should therefore only go for the beta. So I, I might be incorrect in even reciting the the article, what the article was about, but I, I read it. As always, things by Transtrend are extremely interesting. But on that one, I must admit, I uh, had some difficulties wrapping my head around what the core is of what they is, what what it is that they wanted to say. So, if anybody out there has read the article, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind some enlightening and hearing different thoughts on uh, on negative alpha. Yeah, I think actually Harold, when he was on the podcast uh, about a year ago. So he did talk about this, uh, but like you, uh, Moritz, I'm not so sure I fully, I fully got all the uh, nuances uh, of that. But I, I do also enjoy uh, their write-ups, uh, and and obviously we respect them. They're our trend-following friends. Um, what about you, Jerry? Any thoughts? Any other things that caught your attention uh, this week? Uh, not really. Uh, I agree with this article. I'll, I'll tweet it and give everybody the link, and you can uh, give us some feedback, questions next week, and some feedback on why to avoid alpha and how, part two. I think part one I understood. I need help on part two. And, you know, wow, it'd be fun to have Harold just come on the podcast and explain it to us. Yeah, well, absolutely. Sure. I'd like that. Yeah, I'm sure we could have. Arrange for that, maybe not for with a one week notice, but uh, you never know. You never know. All right. Well, I mean, if uh, if that's really where we are in terms of that, then uh, yeah, keep your questions coming. We love it, and uh, hopefully, there the answers that we give uh, are useful for you. And uh, we uh, we certainly hope that you enjoyed this uh, shorter episode uh, today. Um, and if you like what you heard, of of course, as always, we. We'd love for you to leave us a rating and review in iTunes. Uh, they really do help, and uh, and other people will uh, have a better chance of discovering the show if, if you do. So we really appreciate uh, that support we get from all of you. From Jerry, Moritz, and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on next week's edition of The Systematic Investor. And in the meantime, have a wonderful week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor podcast series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.